Welcome to the Tech Meme Ride Home for Monday, June 22nd, 2020. I'm Brian McCullough. Today, all of the headlines I can manage to cram in from today's Worldwide Developer Conference from Apple. Hey gets approved by Apple, by the way. Google's ad revenue will decline for the first time probably in, well, ever. And why Animal Crossing might have shied Nintendo away from mobile gaming again. Here's what you missed today in the world of tech. And here we go. It was the most unusual WWDC that we've seen so far. No audience, no stage, really. Tim Cook actually came out at the beginning in front of the empty seats in the Steve Jobs Theater, and he spoke about racial justice and COVID-19 at the very start. But then he threw it to a series of several different folks for pre-recorded videos, which took some of the fun away because, of course, there was no chance for flubs, but also let us take a tour around various Apple locations. Craig Federighi kicked things off by officially announcing iOS 14 and just running down my list of some of the new features there. There's going to be a revamped home screen. There will be data-rich widgets that can go on that home screen. There will also be something called the App Library to automatically group apps together. And a new Today view, which is where you can actually pull those widgets from that you can now resize and move around and put on your home screen. Picture in Picture is coming to the iPhone for the first time, and it looked like it worked pretty much the way it does on the iPad. Siri is being redesigned to be less intrusive. It won't take over your whole screen when you use it anymore. And what was most impressive to me, but probably long past due considering the competition, there's a new iOS app called Translate that will enable live translation between language pairs, and it will do this on device, which Apple kept saying was key for security, but more often, of course, in actual use would be most useful when you don't have an internet connection. Messages are getting pinned conversations, inline replies, improved notification options like the ability to only be pinged by a conversation when you're actually mentioned in it, a whole bunch of Memoji stuff. Cycling directions are coming to Apple Maps, also special EV routing for folks with electric vehicles. Maps will actually track your car's charge and then route you to compatible stations. Keyless car starting is coming to CarPlay. It's actually car starting and car opening. It will start with the 2021 BMW 5 Series, which I believe is available next month. Yes, you can unlock and start your car with your iPhone. Eventually, you'll be able to do this even without taking your iPhone out of your purse, even, although I think that's coming in about a year. A really big thing coming to the App Store is something called App Clips, which are small sort of stub versions of apps that you might need, but maybe you haven't downloaded that app yet. So it's not the full app. It's just, as I said, sort of a stub app that downloads just what you need in the moment. So for example, if you decided you wanted to hop on an electric bicycle or scooter or something, but you didn't want to go through the whole sign up process and downloading the app and all that stuff, because the app clips will use Apple Pay and NFC, You'll be able to download them on the fly and use them almost instantaneously, even to do things like, you know, uh, pay parking meters and things like that. App clips won't sit on your home screen because, again, they're stubs, but you can pull them back out when and how you need them. And if you do want to go back and download the full app, you can at any time. For ease of use, ease of download and such, each app clip will be no more than 10 megabytes in size. So developers, that's the biggest of the consumer-facing marching orders, get those clips small. On to iPadOS, really nothing much that impressed me overly there. There's something called the sidebar. Phone calls won't take over the entire screen anymore, sort of like they promised with Siri, but then that feature is coming to iOS as well. There are enhancements for the pencil, like scribble to insert into text fields. But yeah, kind of the same old, same old for iPadOS. Big news for AirPods. AirPods will now seamlessly move between devices, which I can't believe it's taken this long, but for God's sake, if that works, that will be insanely great. AirPods Pro are getting something called spatial audio. Basically, if you watch video on AirPods Pro, they'll sort of spoof you into hearing directional sound, surround sound-like experience. It makes use of the gyroscopes inside the AirPods Pro to keep the sound source sort of anchored. 
you really might have to watch the video to better explain this one. It will all apparently work with 5.1, 7.1 surround, and even Dolby Atmos. Watch OS has a bunch of updates. You can now create multiple complications. So one app can now have multiple complications on a single watch face. You can share watch faces you like with others in your contacts. Developers can create pre-configured watch faces that people can auto-install on their watches. Dance is now a new workout available on the Activity app, and actually Activity is being renamed Fitness. But the biggest news is that sleep tracking is coming to the Apple Watch. There's an app called Wind Down that will help you create a routine that turns on Do Not Disturb and sets up routines like starting meditation apps, turning on music, and stuff like that. The watch gets a while you were sleeping setting and haptic alarms to wake you up, and then all of the sort of bells and whistles in terms of tracking the quality of your sleep throughout the night. The Apple Watch will now also detect when you're washing your hands and will give you a countdown to make sure you're doing a good job and washing as long as you need to. Looks sort of cute and useful. Uh, Developer-focused stuff. Sign-in with Apple. Developers, you can now convert your existing sign-in systems to sign-in with Apple. HomeKit is getting new features, including person identification, drawing from people you've tagged in your photos, suggested automations, and more. Do you think they highlighted all of the security features of using HomeKit over other home automation options? You bet they did. Apple TV 14. You can now share videos you have with someone else's Apple TV. Apple TV Plus got to mention they demoed the Foundation TV series that Apple is working on based on the Isaac Asimov novels. And I got to say, I know I'm a huge sci-fi nerd and all that, but it looked pretty damn good if you ask me. Let's start with Mac OS, though. The new version will be called bum, 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 Big Sur. Apple claimed that Big Sur is the biggest design change since OS X began. There's new dock design, new finder design, new mail design, new calendar design, new translucent menu bar. Biggest news, I guess, is that Control Center is coming to the Mac. Straight from iOS, you can drag controls into your menu bar. You can customize them. The redesigned widgets are coming to the Mac as well. But then the headline stuff. They made it official. The Mac is transitioning to Apple's own custom silicon. We got to go into one of Apple's labs in an undisclosed location, they said, but the video suggested it was underneath the pond at Apple HQ. Johnny Sruji talked about the whole history of Apple's A-chip line, talking about CPU performance and energy suck. That was the key to everything they talked about in this section. High performance with lower power consumption is the holy grail of what they're going for here. That's where they want to take the Mac, Johnny said. He said they're developing what he was calling a family of SOCs for the whole Mac ecosystem. Is Apple hinting that they might end up doing the GPUs as well? That was sort of interesting. Craig Federighi came back to tell us that actually Big Sur is super optimized to make this transition. This was a surprise. All Apple apps, including Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro, can already run natively on Apple's new silicon from day one. And everything developers will need to transition their apps into this new paradigm will be built into Xcode. Switching over, said Federighi, could take a matter of days to recompile, he says, so sounds super simple. Microsoft is already working on getting Office ready for Apple Silicon. Adobe is already working on Photoshop's transition. They showed Final Cut Pro playing back 4K video. And one thing that they mentioned that I thought was interesting is once this transition happens, it will allow you to download iPhone and iPad apps right there in the Mac App Store. There's a Rosetta 2 that will apparently help translate all of your existing Mac apps really simply. And also, devs, the Developer Transition Kit will be a Mac Mini with an A12Z SoC, 16 gigabytes of memory, 512 gigabytes of SSD, a slew of Mac I.O. ports, and a custom version of Big Sur. That new developer transition kit will begin shipping this week. Tim came back at the end to talk about the timeline of the transition. He said it would take about two years for the full transition to be made, but in the interim, there will be more Intel-based Macs coming. Which, yeah, talk about it's going to be hard to convince anyone to invest in one of those. Also, I wonder how long Apple will end up committing to supporting those Intel Macs. 
Finally, they announced that all of the OSs will be in dev beta today, public beta next month, and will be out to customers in the fall. Just checking my notes here to see anything that I missed. iOS 14 will be compatible with older iPhones going back to the original iPhone SE and the iPhone 6S and 6S Plus. Back on the privacy tip, Apple is making it super easy for you to see the personal info that apps are requesting via a new privacy nutrition label. Also, they added the ability to share just approximate location data with apps instead of your actual location data. There was no one more thing. There were no hardware announcements, and so there you go. We'll dig more into what people thought about all this tomorrow and, of course, on the weekend bonus episode. But that was WWDC 2020. I do, of course, want to get to some non-WWDC news as well, but I got to mention this real quick. About three hours before WWDC kicked off, it came out that Apple had officially approved Hay's email app, since it had been updated with small tweaks to bring it in line with Apple's App Store guidelines. Hay still has no in-app purchases or signups, so the workaround went like this, quoting Nilay Patel in The Verge. Basecamp isn't done with the fight. The company has submitted a new version of Hay that meets the strict letter of Apple's rules but clearly defies their spirit. The company will now offer iOS users a free temporary Hay email account with a randomized address just so the app is functional when it is first opened. These burner accounts will expire after 14 days. Hay is also now able to work with enterprise customers, as Apple initially took issue with the app's consumer focus. Hay has not adopted Apple's own in-app payment system or allowed users to sign up for its full paid service through the iOS app. Instead, users will still need to subscribe by going directly to Hay's website. It remains to be seen whether these changes will thread the needle to Apple's satisfaction, but Basecamp is clearly betting that Apple will have to allow future versions of the app now that it does something on launch. We're going to take Phil Schiller on his word here, Basecamp CTO David Hennemeyer Hansen tells me. The chief complaint was that you download the app and it doesn't work, even though lots of apps work like that, end quote. On Twitter, DHH himself said the following, To make all this happen, our team has been working the weekend. It wasn't how I would have liked to spend Father's Day, but if finding a truce with Apple now meant avoiding years of grueling litigation, it seemed like a worthy trade. Huge thanks to everyone at Basecamp for this. The Hay launch has exceeded even our wildest dreams. It took us almost five months to get to 30,000 people interested. It took one week to get to 100,000. And that's people who were so interested that they'd write us an email with a story, poem, or note. It's mind-blown emoji. But I'm not going to pop the champagne just yet. We firmly believe we did what Phil Schiller asked us to do, but Apple still holds all the power. All we can do now is pray that feverishly working the Father's Day weekend is enough to appease Apple, end quote. You might have seen this over the weekend, but I think it's worth mentioning, even if a lot of folks have been expressing their doubts ever since, TikTok users and K-pop fans claim that they combined forces to register thousands of tickets for President Trump's rally on Saturday in Tulsa, Oklahoma, contributing to what looked to be lower-than-expected turnout as none of those TikTok users and K-pop fans actually showed up. Quoting the great Taylor Lawrence and company in the New York Times, After the Trump campaign's official account, at Team Trump posted a tweet asking supporters to register for free tickets using their phones on June 11th, K-pop fan accounts began sharing the information with followers, encouraging them to register for the rally, and then not show. The trend quickly spread on TikTok, where videos with millions of views instructed users to do the same, as CNN reported on Tuesday. Oh no, I signed up for a Trump rally and I can't go, one woman joked, along with a fake cough, and a TikTok posted on June 15th. Thousands of other users posted similar tweets and videos to TikTok that racked up millions of views. Representatives for TikTok did not immediately respond to requests for comment. It spread mostly through alt-TikTok. We kept it on the quiet side where people do pranks and a lot of activism, said the YouTuber Elijah Daniel, 26, who participated in the social media campaign. K-pop Twitter and alt-TikTok have a good alliance where they spread information amongst each other very quickly. They all know the algorithms and how they can boost video to get where they want, end quote. 
Many users deleted their posts after 24 to 48 hours in order to conceal their plan and keep it from spreading into the mainstream internet. Quote, the majority of people who made them deleted them after the first day because we didn't want the Trump campaign to catch wind, Mr. Daniel said. These kids are smart and they thought of everything, end quote. eMarketer is confirming that it expects Google's U.S. ad revenue to decline in 2020 for the first time since it started tracking such things in 2008. Turns out, Google relies pretty, pretty heavily on the travel industry for ads, quoting the Wall Street Journal. The biggest single culprit here is the travel industry, which has been both hardest hit by the pandemic generally and has concentrated spending on Google in the past, said Nicole Perrin, principal analyst at eMarketer. We have already heard statements from major travel companies like Expedia that normally spend billions of dollars on Google, mostly on search, that they are pulling back spending on Google and search, and that will continue for the rest of this year, end quote. Travel represented about 11% of search ad revenue in 2019, Needham analyst Laura Martin estimated. Expedia, which owns brands such as Travelocity, Orbitz, and VRBO, has historically been one of Google Search's biggest advertisers, according to data from the advertising research company Kantar. On an earnings call in May, Expedia CEO Peter Kern said the pandemic offered the company an, quote, opportunity of an entire reset on its traditionally search-heavy advertising spending. Expedia has warned its investors that a risk for the company is the way Google has launched travel products in recent years that compete directly with its largest advertising partners and then uses its search function to drive users to its own products. Quote, as we wade back in, we're able to be more precise, be more constrained, watch and learn and grow into it, and not just dive back in head first and spend back to the levels we were at, he said. eMarketer also pointed to Amazon, another big search spender, pulling back its search spending sharply as the pandemic hit as it struggled to fulfill orders, end quote. Yeah, if travel continues to be depressed, and then if, say, I don't know, Amazon and eBay decided to pull back on their keyword advertising, Google might actually be in real trouble, right? One of the underappreciated things about the big tech oligarchs is how reliant they often are on each other in weirdly incestuous ways. For example, I was reading an article this morning that reminded me that Apple still gets around $10 billion a year in revenue from Google. Finally today, Bloomberg is reporting that Nintendo is reconsidering the tiny toe that it stuck into the waters of developing smartphone games. Why? Turns out the success of Animal Crossing has made Nintendo re-get religion about the strength of its own platforms, quoting Bloomberg. Nintendo president Shintaro Furukawa proclaimed two years ago that smartphone games would be a $1 billion business with growth potential, building on his predecessor's promise that Nintendo would release two to three mobile titles each year. That spurred hopes among investors that the gaming powerhouse could carve out a substantial slice of the market. In May, however, the president adopted a markedly different tune, saying, quote, we are not necessarily looking to continue releasing many new applications for the mobile market, end quote. Nintendo's shares slid 4% the day after that remark. Close observers might have sensed Nintendo was growing disillusioned with the mobile realm even earlier. Its smartphone games project was born out of necessity to shore up the bottom line amid the Wii U's failure. Now, riding a surge in Switch popularity and investor confidence, the Kyoto-based company appears to have reassessed the mobile business and narrowed its focus to its own console ecosystem. Nintendo's Animal Crossing mobile app, saw a 45% uptick in earnings as the Switch game was released, per Sensor Tower's data, but the company doesn't find the Square Enix model appealing. Unlike game studios who have to pay a platform fee, whether on console or mobile, Nintendo has a strong incentive to focus all gamer spending on its own platform, where it doesn't have to share revenue. Its goal is to send customers from smartphones to consoles, not the other way around. Nintendo's dimmed enthusiasm for smartphone games is driven not only by disappointing revenues and unsatisfying monetization options, but also by the limitations of the platform. The company believes its franchises shine brightest when coupled with designed by Nintendo controllers, and it's never been fully comfortable with the touchscreen-only interface of a phone. New smartphone games will come, but it's very likely these will just be alibi releases to appease shareholders, one analyst wrote." End quote.
Nothing to share since getting this out the door is the priority. Talk to you tomorrow.